بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين so we've reached the point of managing anger, anger management. Fight fair. Manage your anger. Which indicates we're going to get angry. Even in the hadith of the Prophet that So a man came to the Prophet Don't get angry. That doesn't mean you look at any uh, commentary on that hadith, it doesn't mean never be angry. Because there, there are other hadith and other teachings that indicate we should get angry for certain things, for the sake of Allah, in the face of an oppressor. We should manifest anger. But what it means is don't behave and act in a state of anger. And don't allow your anger to remove you from the realm of lawful behavior. That's what it means. It doesn't mean never get angry. That would be uh, ordering us with something we don't have the uh, capacity to bear and to implement. Because every human being, so the Prophet وسلم, got angry on occasion. What the hadith means is don't act in a state of anger and never allow your anger to remove you from the realm of lawful behavior. That's what it means. So the emphasis is on managing your anger. Your anger. So as we mentioned before, if we're believers, then our Islamic teachings should check how we act when we're angry, especially in the context of our relationships. Um, and, it, and more particularly, our relationships in general but our relationships with each other as Muslims specifically. Otherwise, if we allow our anger to overwhelm us, if we allow our anger, anger to control our tongues and unleash our tongues against each other in unacceptable ways, there's some serious consequences. So, for example, the first ayah that's up here, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَكْتَسَبُوا so those who harm and abuse the believers, and many times our language is abusive to each other, to our fellow believers. For other than that which they deserve or have earned. Such people have incurred uh, a great transgression and clear sin. If mubina, it is sinful. We have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many relationships, and again at all level, between husbands and wives, parents and children, children and parents, friends and associates have been ruined due to an inappropriate word or action that was undertaken during a fit of anger. And then there's nothing but regret. Because once those words are, are unleashed, we can't bring them back. It's like that email you send out, and then 10 seconds later you say, I shouldn't have sent that. I shouldn't have hit send. But once you hit send, you can't bring it back. I, at most services, you can't. Maybe Silicon Valley, you know something I don't know. Let me know. But <laughs> once you hit send on that button in your heart and your tongue responds, you can't bring that word back. And oftentimes, not oftentimes, but sometimes, that word inv involves great harm to the believers. So we should be cognizant of that. So this is a source of great 
a great transgression and clear sin. Uh, the Prophet, or Allah Ta'ala mentions in Hadith Qudsi, Man adali waliyan faqad adhantuhu bil harb. So this is on, there are only three offenses in the whole corpus of our religious teachings that Allah Ta'ala declares war against. Two are well known. One is here. One, whoever transgresses against the one I have befriended and taken under my care and protection, then I declare war against that person. فَقَدْ أَذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Okay? And the second, the one who consumes riba. The third, I actually uh, forgot. It's a very rare one. And most, it's not mentioned in most books, but it is mentioned in uh, uh, Ibn Hajj al-Haytami's book, Al-Zawajir. So uh, I'll try to track it down. Uh, in any case, this is one. Man adali waliyan, whoever transgresses, offends, harms one I have befriended, the one I've taken under my care and protection, فَقَدْ أَذَنْتُهُ harb. I declare war against that person. Why is that relevant here? In the context of marriage or relationships between believers in general, why, is, why do we mention that here? What is the relevance of that in terms of what we're talking about right now? None of us knows who these awliya are. Wali, singular, plural, awliya. None of us know who the awliya of Allah Ta'ala are. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ Allah لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ Any believer who has taqwa, who has piety, can be a wali. أَلَا إِنَّ أَوْلِيَاءَ اللَّهِ Are not the, those beloved and protected by Allah? The there will be no fear or grief upon them. Who are they? Those who believe. And they have taqwa. That could be any believer on the face of the earth. That could be any believer on the face of the earth. إِنَّ وُلِيَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْكِتَابِ وَهُوَ يَتَوَلَّ الصَّالِحِينَ So my protecting friend is Allah who has revealed the scripture and he undertakes the affair of the righteous. It could be any salih. إِنَّ وُلِيَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِي نَزَّلَ الْكِتَابِ وَهُوَ يَتَوَلَّ الصَّالِحِينَ Any salih. So in other words, your husband, your wife, your parent, your child, your neighbor, your brother, your sister, believer, can be a wali. And when you speak and, uh, harshly to them, when you harm them with your words or your deeds, that can invoke the war of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. Not because I said it, Allah ta'ala said it, hadith Qudsi, and Abi Hurairah radiallahu an. عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يرويه عن ربه عز وجل من عاد لي وليا فقد أذنته بالحرب. خلاص. We have to be very very careful how we treat each other. And that being the case, we have to manage our anger. Again, we're going to get angry. We're humans. We're going to get angry. But when we do. It's time to make wudu, to put that fire out. It's time to sit down to change our state. So a physical change in state results in a, a spiritual change in state. If we're sitting down, we should recline. These are all instructions we've been given to manage anger. If none of that seems to, uh, the first thing, bismillah. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim if none of that works, leave, physically leave, you know, let's talk about this later. Bam, I'm out of here. Change the environment. Another hadith, man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir fal yaqul khayran aw liyasmut. 
Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him or her speak well or remain silent. Speak well or remain silent. Well, من كان يؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر فليقول خيرا أو ليصمت. So again, if we don't have something good to say, and there's no good in that. Well, what about you? There's no good in that. It's like those New York Times presentations, depictions of Muslims. There's no good in that. لا خير فليقول خيرا أو ليصمد. I'm going to reposition the computer just so I don't have to run back and forth to change pages. Bismillah. So, and we're here. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, speak well or remain silent. So sometimes uh, we have to condition ourselves, restrain ourselves, force ourselves to be silent. And it's in everyone's best interest. All right. Now, as we mentioned, in any relationship, friends, husband, wife, parent, child, any relationship, there's going to be bouts of anger. Human beings cannot go through this world and never get angry. If we did, we'd be angels. We wouldn't be human beings. So there's going to be ang uh, anger. The important thing for us is not to speak or act when we're angry, as we mentioned. That's what's important. When we feel that anger welling up in us, it's time to be silent, and it's time to refrain and restrain our actions. Because if we act in this state, in all likelihood, we're going to do something that's regrettable. As you all know, the Qadi cannot rule in a state of anger. So if a judge is angered by something, that judge cannot issue a ruling until his anger subsides. And then he can issue a verdict. But in a state of anger, because anger affects our thought processes. So uh, don't speak or act. Now let's read this very carefully here. Most arguments or ill-advised words can be avoided if we respect, respect the halt rule. What does halt mean? Halt. Yes. To stop. So we're marching. Halt. Stop. So what is the halt rule? Don't try to talk. Stop talking. Don't try to talk about serious matters. If you or your spouse, or your friend, or your parent, or your child are hungry, angry, tired, lazy, or tired, exhausted. Think how many, how many arguments have occurred because someone was not allowed to go get something to eat. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> need to eat something. No, we're talking about this right now. <laughs> okay, if you're, if you're hungry, don't talk about anything serious because it's going to make problems. Seriously, this is tried and tested. Angry, this is the context we're talking about right now. Lazy, you just are languid. You don't have any, uh, you don't feel like doing anything. Or tired, you're just worn out. So laziness is more of a mental state. So a lot of lazy people have energy. They just don't have the frame of mind to expend that energy. And tired or fatigued is you just don't have any energy. But in all cases, when one tries to talk about serious things in these states, problems usually ensue. And this is scientifically verified. I'm not making this up. All of these states, or none of these states, rather, are conducive to uh, productive conversations. So go get something to eat, take a nap, uh, refresh yourself, let the anger die down, and then talk about something that's really serious or 
significant. Never try to win an argument because a serious discussion should be undertaken to manifest the truth and not to uh, impose your point of view on the other person. So if that's the case, if, a, if an argument, a dispute within the parameters of acceptability is undertaken to arrive at the truth, when we start trying to win, then we're in it for our nefs, for our ego, and not for the truth. We're in it for our ego, for the sake of our ego, and not for the sake of the truth. As Imam Shafi uh, mentioned, to paraphrase him, that I love to see the truth manifested on the tongue of my opponent because I'm interested in the truth and not in my opinion. So if my opponent brings forth the truth, that's what I'm after. So that should be one of our uh, codes, one of the things we operate by, that whenever we're in an argument or, in, or a discussion, and an argument doesn't necessarily mean a heated exchange. That's a heated argument. An argument is an exchange undertaken to establish the truth. So when there's a case, now will the, pro the defense now present its arguments. So that doesn't mean the defense law argument, Okay, judge, like these people. That's an argument is a systematic presentation of ideas to manifest the truth. So it's not just yelling and screaming. So if we're discussing in an intelligent fashion, we're arguing this particular point. Usually we associate that with the kind of dramatics and theatrics we were illustrating earlier. But that's not the case. But this is. This should never be the case. We should never be in an argument to win. We should be in an argument to have the truth manifestation, manifested. And if it's manifested on the tongue of the person we're talking to, that's good. We just want to manifest it. Uh, never invalidate the source of someone's anger. That's a biggie that a lot of people who get into heated arguments oftentimes do. They try to uh, uh, invalidate the source of someone's anger. And that will only make the person more angry. What does it mean? Someone tell me what does that mean, to invalidate the source of someone's anger? And give me an, uh, an example of that. Anybody? Well, not exactly. If you're saying you're wrong, you're not invalidating the source of their anger. You're just not acknowledging it. Yes. I didn't really think you'd be angry about us being different. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. You. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. You. Right. Right. Okay, sister. Yeah, stop acting like a baby. Or something like, uh, you know, if you were mature about this, you wouldn't be upset at all. And so what's that person going to do? Because now you not only invalidated the source of their anger, you just belittled them also, like acting like a baby. You know, I don't know why you people are always protesting. I mean, you have it so good in this country. <laughs> right? Validate the source of someone's angry, anger. So that's something we should never do in the context of an argument. Affirm the anger if it's valid. You should be upset. Uh, we're going to mention an example of this a, a little later. Change your environment. Why? Because the nefs can become comfortable with dysfunction. Soon as that the nefs, the ego, smells the argument. Ah, it gets, oh man, this is going to be good this time. You can become comfortable with dysfunction, and then that becomes the norm. That becomes the norm. You become uncomfortable with peace and serenity. 
So when that happens, we have to change the environment. Why? To put the nafs in a different environment. How come, uh, uh, and so one of the early Muslims said, Mukhalafa to Hawak, Ainu Dawak, and literally Ainu Dawak. So, Bitasil, Mukhalafa to Hawak, Ainu Dawak, changing, opposing the inclination of your soul is the essence of your cure. Imposing the inclination of your soul is the essence of your cure. Why do you think so many people become uh, Muslim in prisons? One reason is the nafs is in an unfamiliar environment. And so now the person has a chance to reflect and to get to a normal level of, of, of internal, uh, what's a good word? internal equilibrium because the dominant environment renders us out of balance. So in an imbalanced state, we cannot reflect on the signs that Allah Ta'ala has placed in his creation and that he pre presents to us in his scripture. But in an, in an environment where we're at a, a greater state, in a greater state of equilibrium, now we can absorb and assimilate those messages and it clicks the way it didn't click when we were in that environment qualified by dysfunction. So the nafs can become very comfortable. Some of you know people that they love a good, a good heated argument. Oh boy, whenever they see it, they're ready to jump in. Yeah, less filling, tastes great. Less filling, tastes great. And, you know. And then they just sit back and enjoy it, revel in it. And so changing that state of familiarity is a key to interrupting that dysfunction and bringing the nafs into a state of balance or equilibrium. Avoid comparisons and competition. So never compare uh, a person you're arguing with with someone else. You're not like so-and-so. He wouldn't be upset by this. Yeah, see, my sister never got upset about that. I'm not your sister. Matter of fact, I'm not even your wife anymore. Be careful with comparisons and competition. And this society encourages competition between men and women. Allah Ta'ala mentioned yesterday, that's why we started off with the brain sex test. The male is in no way like the female. We are different. We're physiologically different. We're emotionally different. And we were made that way to complement each other. And he said, Women are the complementary halves of men. Yes, sir. Oh, we try to measure up to them. That's a different situation. Well, I mean, never compare people you're arguing with with someone else. Like I said, you know, my sister wouldn't get upset by that. Or, you know, if, if you were like a Brother Ahmed, you wouldn't be bothered. By, well, go, back, go marry Brother Ahmed then. So never make comparisons in the context of an argument. Calm discussion, you should, you should try to be more like so-and-so. They have good quality. That's calm, but in an argument. So again, this is in the context of an argument to try to avoid uh, these things. No one is supposed to be abused. We mentioned, la darar wa la dirar. Our religion, one of the foundational principles. There are five foundational maxims. And if, uh, we'll write them on the board. The five foundational legal maxims that qualify and characterize our religion.
So the first al umuru bi maqasidha. So Things, matters are assessed based on their underlying objectives. And that emanates from the hadith in the Mal'amalu bin Niyat. Actions are based on the judged, based on the intentions behind them. The second of these uh, maxims is, uh, and that's the one relevant here. Adarar Yuzal. Harm is to be removed. So there's no way Islam accommodates the harm that comes from violent acts and behavior. You're no good. I, I don't even know why I married you in the first place. How could I have a friend like you with friends like you who needs enemies? And so those things are harmful and hurtful, so they have no basis in the religion. Why? Because harm is to be removed. The darar yuzal. The third. Al-Ada tu muhakkama. That custom has legal weight. So, and this is one of the greatest factors that facilitated the spread of Islam. Islam never tried to eradicate indigenous customs and cultures. That's why you see the wide variety of dress, of food, that you find throughout the Ummah. Is traditional Malaysian cuisine the same as uh, Pakistani cuisine? No, it's traditional, let's say, South Asian cuisine. Indian, Pakistani, Bengali cuisine, the same as the cuisine of the Arabian Peninsula. Certainly not. Is the cuisine of the the Persians, the same as the cuisine of the Turks? No. Is the Chinese, much of classical, what we associate with Chinese cuisine came from the Muslims. Peking duck is a Muslim dish. And the best Peking duck, they go to the Muslims because they want halal Peking duck. If you're in Peking, you get your Peking duck from the Muslims. Halal, Peking duck. That's the best one. And so clothing. Traditionally, the Kurds dress like uh, people in the Emirates 200 years ago. No, Kurds had the, called the big belts and baggy pants. And the people in the Khalij had the dishdasha and the gear there. And the people in Nigeria. Their general themes, loose robe, looseness, covering the nakedness, had the long robes, the striped hats, very regal. There's variety. And Islam never came to eradicate it that everyone has to dress the same way. Wherever it went, wherever there was custom that did not conflict with any direct rulings or teachings or principles of Islam, it was accommodated and absorbed. Were marriages, weddings conducted in Malaysia amongst the Muslims in Malaysia the way weddings are conducted amongst the Muslims in Bosnia? No, it's a tremendous difference. There's the basics, as shuhud, al mahar, al ijab wa qabul, al wilaya. There's the base, awil wikala, but 
the specifics are determined by custom. Why one of the foundational maxims of the religion, al adatu muhakkama. And then the fourth. المشقة تجلب التيسير المشقة تجلب التيسير difficulty Difficulty calls for facilitating ease. So the difference between number two and number four, this is a permanent source of harm that's removed permanently. This is a temporary difficulty that is facilitated or accommodated only as long as it endures. So for example, if you're starving, which is a difficulty, and there's no food available, then one can eat pork or drink wine to preserve one's life. So this doesn't call for a permanent ruling, but a temporary facilitation. That's the difference between two and four. Number four, you once, we a couple weeks ago discussed this even right here, uh, once the scholars knew of the harm in cigarette smoking, then it was permanently forbidden by any scholar that's worth his turban. <laughs> so because why well, it leads to lung cancer, it leads to heart disease, it leads to throat cancer, lung disease. So that was permanently removed, that harm, whereas this is temporary facilitation. And Mashaqqa Tajlib at Taysir. And then the fifth. Uh, لا يزول اليقين عفوا اليقين اليقين لا يزول بالشك so uh, certainty is not removed by doubt. So al yaqinu al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. So certainty, what we're certain of is not removed by doubt. So if you're sure you made wudu this morning and when Vuhr comes and you're not sure if you lost it, then you still have wudu. Why? Because you're certain about making wudu. Got up for fajr, made wudu, didn't go back to bed, studied my Arabic for the Arabic intensive, <laughs> then ran over here, and so never went back to sleep. Now dhuhr comes, did I lose wudu? Mm. So you're not sure, so you have wudu. Why? Certainty is not removed by shek. At a higher level, a person is innocent because we're sure of his or her innocence until proven guilty. We're doubtful about their guilt. So until we have certainty about their guilt, they're innocent. Why? Al-yaqinu la yazulu bishak. So that's a legal principle or maxim that's operative in our system here in the West. So anyway, those are those five legal maxims. How do we get on that tangent? Right here. No one is to be rebuked abused, that darar yuzal. So screaming at someone, insulting them, berating them, belittling them, that is abuse. Uh, manipulating them psychologically in ways that cause pain and stress, that's abuse. And physically striking uh, someone, all of those are forms of abuse that are unacceptable in Islam. 
and they're, they're incongruous with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And those are the sunnah and we have to put emphasis on as much as we emphasize uh, the sunnah of the beard or hijab or the superficial, the miswak, the superficial things. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ never struck a woman. He never struck a child, وسلم. He never berated any of his peop any of the people uh, in his vicinity, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we have to bring these things to mind as we go through our uh, daily life and daily activities. Activities. Uh, there's a saying. There's a variety of this of a, as a hadith, but I, I couldn't find it, and I don't remember the exact wording. So we just presented as a saying and mu'min la yuhini nafsa a believer doesn't expose himself or herself to humiliation so what's the point here if someone's abusing you as we'll state more clearly later on get out of the situation temporarily at least don't stay in a situation where you're abused someone's yelling and screaming at you just say excuse me and leave don't stay there you Stupid, you idiot. You're just an imbecile. You're an ignoramus. I have to find new adjectives to describe the depth of your stupidity. <laughs> just, okay, look, okay, mashallah. While you're thinking of some new words, I'm out of here. <laughs> Don't stay there. A believer doesn't expose himself or herself to humiliation. I know a lot of the uh, shuyukh won't come here any, anymore because they don't want to be humiliated at the border. There's a valid reason not to come here. May Allah give us all afia and a different government. Uh, <laughs> never, feel <laughs> never feel guilty about being angry if your anger is justified. So a lot of times a person will be made so this is on the other side. As we mentioned, we should never invalidate the legitimate anger that someone is displaying. We could try to moderate it, but we shouldn't invalidate it. And we also, on the other side, should not feel guilty if anger is justified. A lot of times, someone will try to make you feel guilty for being angry, and therefore, make you, blame you for being a victim of their abuse. So you're abusing me, I'm upset with it. Well, you shouldn't be upset. And so you're getting guilty. Well, maybe it's, it is my fault or maybe I, I should be more mature about this and, and not act like a baby. And no, you have a valid reason to be upset and so don't be guilty about it. But don't allow that anger to lead you into haram speech or action. An argument does not make you enemies. So when people get angry and have an argument, that doesn't make you enemies. So we mentioned earlier, don't look, or yesterday, don't look for a good guy or a bad guy. Just acknowledge the disagreement. Try to identify the cause of it and move on. And this is where spouses have to be more like family. So how many of you have brothers or sisters? Just about everyone here. How many of you, second question, have had an argument with your brothers and or sisters? And how many of you, despite the argument, kept on being brother and sister? You didn't divorce your brother or sister because of an argument. So sometimes we'll have arguments, but that does not make us enemies. Just like as brothers and sisters, we didn't become enemies. You know, maybe we had an argument at breakfast and then we went out and had dinner together. We didn't become enemies because of an argument, so an argument does not make you enemies. A bad argument can be damaging to a relationship, but most of the arguments we have, they're not a source of enmity, just, you know. And when you can approach it like that, what do you usually do? You laugh at it later on. You say, that, that now... I called you stupid and an idiot. I apologize, seriously. But that argument was stupid and idiotic. 
And then you laugh at it. You know what it was. I mean, just something so silly like that got us almost to blows. You laugh at it and move on. But to have the ability to do that is to have the ability not to allow the argument to make you enemies, to maintain good relations, to understand that, look, there was a cause for this. Let's try to identify that cause as opposed to uh, becoming enemies and then move on, okay? Shouldn't have happened. It was totally idiotic, but it did happen. So let's move on now. Oh, wrong way. Uh, don't be afraid if you're married to, to divorce. This saves marriages. So this goes back to what we mentioned yesterday, being afraid to clash. What does this mean? Don't be afraid to divorce if you're married. If you're married. What does this mean in this context? That's it. Don't be afraid to have that argument. If we have this argument, I'm gonna get, um, I'm, we're going to get divorced. Have the argument, and then that might save your marriage because those frustrations and feelings that you're harboring can eat at you so bad that eventually it's going to lead to a divorce anyway because it's going to lead to an explosion, or you're going to become so alienated from the person, or you're going to just keep... To, uh, taking so much abuse that your whole personality is distorted and there's no meaningful relationship anyway to even salvage. So don't be afraid to divorce. I, I'm not going to take this. And if it need, means to divorce, it does. So now you've expressed yourself, husband or wife, and the other party knows that they're hurting you. Whereas you sitting on it, sitting on it, it's eating you up, you're going to explode, you're going to strangle them, then that'll lead to a divorce because that'll lead to such a violent or traumatic uh, attempt to resolve that underlying problem that there's no space to reconcile. Whereas putting it out on the table, look, you're not talking to me like this no more. I am not your daughter. I'm your wife. I'm not your son. I'm your husband. And you're not going to talk down to me and belittle me like that anymore. And if it means that we don't stay together, that's what it means. So that might be the wake-up call. <laughs> wow, you know, you're right. I'm sorry. I mean, that's, I just, that's a bad habit. I need to work on it. I'm so glad. So don't be afraid to issue that wake-up call that might save the marriage. Whereas if you sit on it and you harbor it and keep it in, that will lead to such a traumatic or dramatic attempt to resolve the issue that there's such a huge explosion, there's no getting back together after it. Yes? No, you're not saying if, if uh, we don't talk about this, you're getting a divorce. We're saying that this behavior will not be tolerated. An ultimatum is then a consequence. You say, this behavior won't be tolerated. If you don't stop, I'm divorcing. All you're saying is, you're not talking to me no more. And so what I mentioned, if the consequence of that is a divorce, then so be it. But you're not stating that. You're just stating there's a particular action or behavior or particular situation that I've been keeping inside that's eating up, eating me up and destroying me and I'm going to talk about it. And if in the course of talking about it, it becomes so stressful that we divorce, so be it. But that usually is not the case. Usually, that will lead to the sort of corrections that will save a marriage or save a relationship, save a friendship. So in that sense, it's not, I wouldn't see it. You might see it that way. I wouldn't see it as an ultimatum. I would just see it as not being afraid to discuss or address a situation that could possibly culminate in a divorce. So that's how I would see it and, and qualify it. And again, this is something that saves marriages because if that, uh, those feelings are internalized and internalized, 
the, the pressure, the guilt, the insecurity will eventually lead to a lashing out that leads to such a huge blow up that it leaves very little space to save that marriage. Again, this goes back to removing the harm. When there is physical or deep psychological abuse, leave and do not go back until the offending party has had professional counseling. Don't live with someone who is harmful in their actions, has deep issues that need professional help and addressing. Get out of there. And don't go back until you are sure that that person has had professional help. And if the professional help isn't forthcoming, don't go back. So if your spouse is treating you like a punching bag, that has nothing to do with Islam. Harm is to be removed by our religion. It has nothing to do with Islam. Leave and don't go back. And sometimes it's very difficult to leave for a number of very involved and complicated reasons. But find the strength to leave and don't go back until you have certified that that person has had some professional help. Other, because what usually happens in situations of severe abuse, severe psychological or physical abuse, is a, a codependent relationship develops and the person will leave temporarily, sometimes to save their life. And then, oh, come back and I didn't mean it and I changed, I talked to the imam and he really let me have it and I'm not gonna do it again. And then two or three weeks later, the same pattern of behavior uh, uh, starts to reoccur. Why? Because there's some deeper psychological, psychiatric issues in many cases that need to be addressed therapeutically and professionally. And until they are, you can read all the hadith in the world, sit down brother, the Prophet said, وسلم, the Prophet never struck a woman or a child. You can read all the hadith in the world. It's not going to address those deeper issues for most people. And the pattern of behavior is going to reoccur, reoccur. If someone is deeply, deeply in touch with Allah Ta'ala and their heart is cleansed to the point of view that admonition from the Quran, from the Sunnah will benefit them, they wouldn't be engaging in those behaviors in the first place. So the fact that a person is engaging in those behaviors is an indication that their heart is not in condition or shape to receive those admonitions. You understand what I'm saying? If a person's heart will be benefited, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَيُقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ فِي كِتَابِهِ الْعَزِيزِ If their heart's going to respond to that, their heart would not allow their limbs to act in the abusive way their limbs are acting in the first place. So the actions and the words are a proof that their hearts won't be benefited by religious admonition. They need professional help to deal with those issues. So, and, and that's why I think it's very important, uh, this area we alluded to earlier when we referred to the Muslim mental health, that Muslims go into these fields so that we can bring the religious admonition, training, and conditioning together with the therapeutic elements and create a very powerful synthesis between the two. And that's a, a, a frontier. A friend of mine, a young uh, family friend, who's at Harvard right now, he's spending the summer working on a program of uh, psychological uh, counseling for Palestinian kids. Kids whose lives have been shaped and formed by the most intense forms of violence, especially psychological violence. But the Israelis, they're not the worst perpetrators of physical violence. Some people don't want to come to grips with that state? They're not. Uh, they destroyed Janin, a camp a few years ago, right? The Syrians destroyed Hama, a whole city. The Afghan Mujahideen, in the name of Jihad, after the Soviets left, destroyed Kabul 
and killed 60,000 people. Right or wrong? Right. Hikmet Yar's group and some of the others bombed Kabul after the Russians left and destroyed the city and killed 60,000 people. The Israelis are not the perpetrators of the greatest amount of physical violence against Muslims. They've done a lot. I'm not justifying anything. But in terms of psychological violence, they have no equal. Sonic booms over villages to terrify the kids, roadblocks to frustrate and humiliate the people, you name it. So in any way, in any case, children whose lives have been shaped by that context or the Afghan context, continuous war since 1980, the Iraqi context, continuous war since 1980, war and embargoes and bombardments, those children have some severe psychological problems. There's no Islamic immunity in that regard. Being Muslim does not make us immune from a lot of the psychological scars that ensue from a life that's surrounded by senseless violence, violence we can make no sense of as a child. If you don't believe that, you think Muslims are immune, I, I recommend you get Frantz Fanon's book, The Wretched of the Earth. How many have heard of that book, The Wretched of the Earth? The last chapter in that book is called The Mental Disorders of Colonial War. Now this is set in Algeria. They're all Muslim. And he is a trained psychiatrist and he documents some of the psychological scars that these Muslim people uh, uh, were exposed to or were visited upon them due to the violence of that anti-colonial struggle against the French. So in any case, to just emphasize the point, when there's physical or psychological abuse that's deep, leave, do not go back until the offending party has had psychological counseling. So if we can do that, we'll end up with a big, big heart full of love, constantly expanding. We'll imbibe the sweet nectar of serendipitous bliss as our hearts skip merrily through fields of ethereal ambrosia. <laughs> OK. All right, that's an indication it's time to go to the workbook, actually. So the anger, page nine, page nine, anger. So go through the first exercise, which is sort of a character assessment. This first exercise is a character assessment. assessment. So if you exaggerate, the example mentioned here, generalize, name call, replay history, or kitchen sink, then you need to take a long, hard look at your character and make some adjustments. Because as it says here, this is far, far removed from the prophetic ideal. And that's what we're aiming for. We're aiming for the prophetic ideal so that our character is a reflection of the character of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The second exercise here is just, again, goes back to the kind of baggage we're carrying. So look at those five things and then reflect on how some of the baggage, if it's present, might ex uh, uh, affect your current relationships. So very quickly, now there's a question here. Uh, what is the problem, at the end of number five, what is the problem with each particular style of dealing with anger? So some are pretty obvious. We'll forego that in the interest of time. 
All right, now we're going to move on to the next area of examination, which is power struggles. So again, Islam is the greatest cure to power struggles. Why? Because it's supposed to cure the nafs. And the nafs is the source of power struggles. Me, me, myself, and I. I want to be on top. I want to be top dog. I want to be the one that's calling the shots. I want to be the shot caller, Ansari. I want to call the shots. <laughs> so Islam is supposed to get rid of that me. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ So the one who fears this station of his Lord and denies his ego, his soul, those things, its caprice drives it towards. Its vain inclination pushes it towards. Paradise will be his or her final abode. فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ So an integral part of the path to paradise is suppressing that nafs, suppressing that hawa. What are the four great enemies of the human being? Four great enemies of the human being. Two are here, and nafs, the ego, and shaitan, the devil, and dunya, the world, and the al hawa, the hawa, the, the vain inclination, the whim, that's a good world were the whims of the, of the soul. So the soul, the ego, the whims of the soul, Satan, the devil, and the world. Those are the great, four great enemies of the human being. You have to oppose them. And one of the great psychological motivations is fearing the station of Allah Ta'ala. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ In the old days, how, how many of you uh, have heard this expression before? I'm going to put the fear of God in that boy. How many of you have heard that? Yes, indeed. The old days, they will put the fear of God in you. Nowadays, if you try to put the fear of God in children, they'll call the Department of Youth Services. And a lot of us say, alhamdulillah, someone put the fear of God in me. But the Quran wants us to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala wants us to fear Allah ta'ala. The Prophet wants us to fear Allah ta'ala as a psychological fear, psychological motivation towards good and constructive behavior. So this is Islam. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. So the Hadith, one of our uh, invocations. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله. There's no strength or power except with Allah. So once we internalize that meaning, we're not trying to say لا حول ولا قوة إلا أنا. That's how a lot of people are functioning. And that's what the contemporary uh, systems of thought, intellectual currents encourage. You the man. You the woman. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. Right? That's what, that's what we've been conditioned in this society. Those messages have been pounded into people. Those messages have been pounded into people. This message should be impressed on our hearts. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And we mentioned this hadith earlier, but here in a different a context. Ma naqasat sadaqatun min mal. Wa ma zadullahu abdan bi afwin illa izza. Wa ma tawada'a ahadun lilla illa rafa'ahu Allah. So charity will never decrease your wealth. And Allah only increases a servant who has the, the ability to pardon others 
by exalting that servant, and no one humbles themselves for the sake of Allah except that Allah exalts them. Why do we mention that here? We mention that here to emphasize not thinking in material terms. The power is based on material calculations and assessments. Power is the epitome of materialistic thinking. And as materialistic thinking generally, especially in the West, replaced metaphysical thinking, physical thinking, replaced metaphysical thinking, focus on physical realities, replace focus on metaphysical realities, then you have philosophies developing that accentuated the desire and the quest for power based on physical realities. One of the first articulators of such a philosophy was Machiavelli. When Machiavelli wrote The Prince and the Discourses, he was a Catholic, Italian, Machiavelli. What happened? He was excommunicated from the Catholic Church when he propagated or promulgated the thesis that the ends justify the means. The church said, my God, how can someone think like that? But now Machiavellian thought is the dominant paradigm that most people are operating on. And it's extension into the realm of politics. Any political science majors out here? What is the extension of Machia? Do you do international relations? Oh, okay. Any international relations student? Don't be shy. Or maybe you know anyway. What's the extension of Machiavelli into international relations? Politics between nations. Hans Morgenthau, Hans Morgenthau, he and Hans Morgenthau, that is, uh, to use the word as it's used figuratively, that is the Bible of international relations. And so his book is called Power among nations. And the, 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 fun, the fundamental thesis of this book, which he articulates very early on, is that in the power, in the struggle for power amongst nations, everything that you do to enhance your power in your relation with other nations is positive, and anything that diminishes your power will affect you negatively. So it becomes a free-for-all, anarchic struggle amongst nations to enhance their power at the expense of other nations. So this is how we need totally new different types of principles. I hit this thingy there. Uh, in any case, Islam is conditioning us to think in other terms. If you spend your money in charity, it will not decrease your money. Physically, how could it not? When you had X amount of dollars, you gave Y away, so now you're left with Z. But in a non-physical sense, the one who blessed you with that money in the first place will bless you with more money or will put more barakah, more blessing in the money that remains so you do more with it than you would have done if you had kept the original amount. That's barakah. And you've all seen it in your lives. How many times have you had a lot of money, it slipped through your fingers as they say, then it was all gone and you had nothing to show for it. You wonder where did it all go? Where did that tax return check go? How many of you can attest to that? I'm sure most of you, you just don't want to raise your hand. On the other hand, how many times have you had a little bit of money and it stretched and stretched and stretched? This brother said, 
I'm putting my hand up. Man, you don't know how I even got to this program. <laughs> and I didn't have no money. And I got a plane ticket. I got a, a lunch yesterday. <laughs> so there's Baraka. I'll give you uh, proof from the Sierra. Some people like, now you're getting some Sufi stuff out like here. Talking about non-physical. The Prophet, sallallahu and Baraka's. The Prophet وسلم, when the Muhajireen migrated to Medina, right? And then he made brothers and blood brothers between the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Abdurrahman bin Auf made blood brother of one of the Ansaris. And what did the Ansari say to him? He said, My brother, I have two wives. Look at them. Whichever one pleases you, I'll divorce her and she'll be yours. And I'll take my wealth and divide it in half and give you half and I'll keep half. And what did Abdurrahman bin Auf say? Barakallah fi ahlika wa malika dullani ala suq. He said, may Allah bless your family and bless your wealth. Show me where the marketplace is. Because Abdurrahman bin Auf knew how to take care of business. He said, dullani ala suq. He said, Barakal, may Allah bless your wealth and bless your family. Show me where the marketplace is. So this is talking about the same thing. Your wealth will be blessed if you give some of it in charity. What remains will be blessed. So the kind of th thinking that Morgenthau and Machiavelli if you pardon people, if you humble yourself, people will trample on you. You'll end up with footprints on your chest. But if you do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will elevate you. Allah will exalt you. Allah will dignify you. Yes, sir. There is no power. He leads through... judicious example through pardoning. He leads through humility. He leads through example. He leads through balanced and magnanimous discipline. But the most important thing is through the example, through the reminding. فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَنْ يَخَافُ he leads through those areas and not through tyranny and not through uh, brute force and not through taking advantage of his physical strength advantage. A lot of patience and a lot of prayer. So through patience and prayer. And understanding, which is very, very, very important. Understanding that these sociological and psychological realities, they didn't evolve, they did not evolve in one day. They evolved uh, largely over the course of an entire century. From the emergence of the women's suffrage movement, the emergence of uh, enlightenment thinking, the emergence of the various uh, ways of thinking that have influenced the entire world. So that being the case, they're not going to be removed in a short period of time. So if we think that we're going to have the magic hadith or the magic ayah or the magic insight that's going to undo this reality just like that, it's not going to happen. So we have to have the patience and the wisdom to try to just introduce themes that are more consistent with Islamic teachings through our character and our example and over time plant those seeds, try to nurture them and over time they'll bring about a change inshallah and brothers have to understand too that the sisters are working hard at this thing right sisters sisters are not just you know hey this is the year 2008 and this is America, 
and we're equal, and that's Allah blessed us to be here and to inherit this mindset. Sisters are working and trying to, to be uh, a complement and not a competitor with their husbands. So I think we have to nurture each other because there, there are forces, there are strong historical forces at work. There are very powerful intellectual currents at work. And the collective weight of these things uh, isn't, isn't shifted or moved overnight. So we have to work with each other and trust in Allah. And we'll come back to that in the discussion, inshallah. So here, just to, to reiterate, again, we might think if I pardon, if I humble myself, people will think I'm soft. They'll think I'm not a gangster. They'll trample on me. They won't think I'm hard. And this is, this is how our Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And his example is a blessed example. And if we undertake that example for the sake of Allah, then we have the power of Allah assisting us towards accomplishing what we're trying to accomplish. And if Allah is for us, no one can be against us. We have to understand that. What we're going to do right now, we're supposed to take a break, but we'll delay the break a little. We will take the break. At the end, it'll all equal out. We're going to do the power struggle exercise. Now, as I set this up, if you've seen it or participated, sit down. So I need, first of all, five very strong, able-bodied, male volunteers to come forward. All right, Bismillah. My brother from Philly, that hand went right up. Yeah, he's a good candidate. Tafadal, my brother from Sacramento. Bismillah. Uh, you might leave your phone back there in the chair. All right, I need three other, my brother Ansari. Allahu Akbar, I need three other, two. That'll make five able-bodied able -body volunteers. Someone did the push-ups this morning, did the burpees right here. My brother who just raised his hand right here. So I need one more very strong, able body right here. Y'all are bismillah. All right, let's see. We got equal amount of space. There's no stage here. All right, brothers, come over here. Come over here. All right, now over here, over here, brothers. There's no stage. You need more room here. All right. Now I need two other volunteers, two other brothers to volunteer. Abdurrahman Corrales, Allahu Akbar. One other. All right, what's your name, brother? Koram. Koram Abdur. All right, Koram, you and Abdurrahman leave the room right now. Go outside quickly. I'll call you when I need you. Abdurrahman and Koram. Yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. All right, here we go. All right, I want you brothers to lock arms. Link your arms together. All right, we'll see about that. All right, get away from the screen there. Make a complete circle. All right, lock those arms. Now, I got you guys. You said you're strong, able-bodied. See that? All right. Yeah. Okay. Don't let quorum into this circle. We know a little, I, I send Coram in. Uh, Coram, Coram, come here. As your, Abdurrahman, you wait, it's not your turn yet. Coram, yalla. What you have to do, Coram, is get into that circle. They're gonna try to creep you out by any means necessary. So you're gonna have to like, you're gonna have to go in there. Down, sit, 319, sit, hut. Bam. Mm. <laughs> you can jump over the top. Mm. Yeah. Come on, Coram. Where are you from, Coram? Where are you from? Uh, Pakistan. Pa I mean, right now. You live in Pakistan? No, right you now. <laughs> Where? Where? The Bay Area. Oh, the Bay Area. Which city? Santa Clara, represent for Santa Clara. This is your home court, man. This is your home field. You gonna let them just knock you off like that? You're in your home court, home city? Get in that circle. All right, let, let me, hold oh, let me get Abdurrahman. 
Abdurrahman. Yeah, let's get Abdurrahman. All right, Quorum, let's give Quorum a hand. All right, Allah Akbar. All right. Abdurrahman, Bismillah. Fadal. Abdurrahman. All right, your mission, you might want to take your name tag off. All right, you have to get in that circle by any means necessary. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Power struggle exercise. What's your name again, man? Zach K from Philly. All right. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Masha Allah. Masha Allah. That is the power struggle. Uh, I hope your sisters, you understand why I didn't pick any sisters. I'm the, it wasn't nothing against the sisters. It just might have been a sister who was like, ah, ta, poi, poi, poi. Allahu Akbar. That is the power struggle exercise. Let's analyze that. Bismillah. Now, these are some lessons this exercise teaches us about power struggles. These are some lessons that we learn about power struggles. First of all, Roles in power relationships are usually assumed uncritically. Uncritically. They, n they never ask me why we're doing this. No one even asked, what does this have to do with what we're doing here? There is absolutely no question of the roles I assign to everyone. That's the nature of power. That's the nature of power relationships. People usually assume their roles uncritically. So if a person grows up in a society, I'm a woman, this is how we're supposed to act. I'm a man, this is how we're supposed to act. There's very little criticism in most cases. Guardians of privilege are usually fanatical. So the brothers who had their arms linked, they were guarding a privilege, the privilege to be inside of the circle. Would you say they were pretty fanatical in guarding that privilege? And to emphasize their fanaticism, there was absolutely nothing at stake. Nothing at stake. If Quorum or Abdurrahman get into that circle, you guys are out of this program. And you don't get a refund. And you can't have lunch either. <laughs> there was absolutely nothing at stake. Your pride was at stake. Okay, you could. Eh, eh, all right. Well, well, and, and that's that's why a lot of men in their marriages are fanatical guardians of privilege, because their pride and their manhood is at stake. So I can't let my wife talk to me like that. I'm supposed to be a man. So what about the Sunnah? The Prophet just ignored it. Well, he was a different kind of man. And I'm this kind of man, and I'm not taking it. Uh, rules are usually enforced indiscriminately. Now, I never once told them to keep Abdurrahman out. They got killed for nothing. <laughs> Did I? I said keep Quorum out. I never said kept, keep Abdurrahman out. I didn't even hint. I didn't even hint. But rules, once they're endorsed, are usually enforced indiscriminately. So in a power relationship, oftentimes we don't discriminate. 
and we don't uh, try to accommodate nuances. We just take that, what we understand, and then we run with it. An in-group can be formed around the smallest thing. So the people linking their arms, they were an in-group. And essentially, they were defending uh, a square foot, a square meter of carpet, because they had a pretty tight circle. So they were f defending about this much carpet. Now look, they, they almost killed Coram. Do you notice the headlock that they applied to Coram? And I mean, Abdurrahman, we have to give him credit, but he had to work. Did you have to work, Abdurrahman? He had to work to get in that circle, and they, they tried to kill him too. <laughs> Over a square foot of carpet. So what if something real was at stake? What would people do? With absolutely no consequences. What if this carpet was our ancestral homeland, and those were the perceived intruders or invaders? What if this carpet was the promised land that God promised us? What will we do to keep someone out? If we're doing all that for a piece of carpet, <laughs> guys almost had heart attacks. Brothers feeling the heart right now? <laughs> Looking for some aspirin or something? Exclusion can lead to frustration and depression. Coram, you feel frustrated at the time. <laughs> you weren't frustrated? You didn't have enough ups for that. <laughs> okay. So, so at the time, once they have repulsed your numerous assaults, you weren't frustrated a little? Just a little? At the time, you were. You, have, you must admit. Was it slightly depressing? At the time. You've recovered now. <laughs> Just slightly depressing. Just frustrated, but not slightly depressed as you walk back to your seat. The, the hand, the applause helped, I would assume. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. We said it can, not always, it can lead to frustration and depression, being kept out. So as we relate with each other, we should keep these things in mind. We should always uh, look critically at the roles we sometimes assume we're supposed to uh, uh, play. Uh, we should try to avoid fanaticism in guarding any worldly privilege because ultimately it's not about this world, it's about the akhirah. So if a few things slip to the cracks in the dunya, so be it. Uh, we should always be discriminant and look for nuances when we're applying rules and regulations. And this goes right to the heart of our gender relations because a lot of times, you know, the prophet said, the man should do this, these are my rights and responsibilities, these are your rights and responsibilities, and we get into these very mechanical relationships where we lose the ability to have nuance. We lose the ability to understand the subtleties and the distinctions of every human being, that they're unique and that that provides a context for applying those rules and regulations and assuming those roles, rights, and duties. Uh, we should try to avoid uh, creating cliques that exclude others. We should realize our religion is open. Look at the variety here. Islam is open to Arabs and Africans, African Americans, white Americans, Asians, Latinos. Everyone is in this room represented right now. 
Every, all of these groups are represented. Why? Because Islam is the most accommodating social phenomenon in history. In history. And we should not limit it. We should not limit it in our sphere of personal relationships, nor should we limit it in the context of our group relationships. We should keep it the open, beautiful phenomenon that it is, and not impose our narrowness on it. So those are just some things that we can learn from that brief exercise. So uh, we'll, we'll stop right here, and we'll continue when we come back uh, with some common sources of power struggles.